I think we're already kind of bumping into that. Um, hey, and and let me announce right here, we haven't officially started, but I'm not imagining that this many people can say enough <laughs> that they want to say in um, in an hour. So I'm imagining we're going to continue this next week at least, if you all can make it back and maybe again. Um, so we'll so. Um, I'll just say that to you before we officially start. Zach, do you want to test your microphone? Can Hi you there. hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Nice to finally meet, see your face, Paul. Cool. <laughs> right. so, thank you for giving us some of your time. Of course. <laughs> Um, we're going to start right on time here at 9 o'clock. Um, as soon as I can see that the broadcast is live, it looks like it is, right? Let me just go check for sure. Yep. Yep, we are live. Okay, good. Let's go back here and maybe 30 seconds early. Right, let's start. Um, edtechtalk.com slash ttt is the place where you can um, listen and chat and let us know that you'd like to get into the Hangout and we'll try to figure that out um, as we go here. Um, so, so, welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is April 30th, 2014 and um, we have a really lovely group of people who have come to talk about MOOCs and um, kind of excited about it. I've been thinking that, and I just want to just introduce where my head is and then just check in with everybody as we start, is that I've, I don't remember thinking of something in such a theoretical and very practical way at the same time. Um, so that's that's one of my reflections. Uh, MOOCs are kind of exciting that way. Um, so I, we hope to get into some questions and specifically I think um, Karen and Christina, um, that mainly Karen has pushed us this way and Karen maybe you can uh, frame it a bit at the beginning. Um, we want to talk about MOOCs in terms of intergen intergenerational MOOCs. And we have some people here who have some experience with that. And, but we're willing and happy to have this go in any direction you guys want to take it in. Karen, do you want to help me with the introduction a little bit? I consider you a co-conspirator, don't you? <laughs> um, yeah. Sure. I guess, well, to start this, um, a group of us are starting on um, the second iteration of Making Connected Learning, which is the CL MOOC. Um, which will be happening this summer, which we are very excited about. And we were thinking, um, sort of coming out of a couple other MOOCs that I was involved in that had some youth involvement, and then just thinking about how much stronger um, many of our professional learning experiences are when they are cross-generational, sort of how we would um, think about that for CL MOOC in terms of involving youth in that. So that was kind of the framing for this. And I would say um, th that question brings up a lot of other questions like what is a MOOC which we can go back to and like who's the audience and, and things like that. Uh, Zach, we've broken a, a, one, of, one of the things that uh, we've thought about here in the New York City Writing Project uh, in our summer work with where we do some co-learning with um, is that we like to have three youths for every one adult in, in an experience so that the space is is felt like a, a youth space. We're, we're, we're terrible tonight. We got like nine to one here. But um, <laughs> so you're representing for us, if you don't mind. Unfortunately, but, this is better than most conversations. <laughs> yeah. So introduce yourself a little bit and uh, just so we can. Yeah, sure. Okay. So I am presently a sophomore at the University of Maryland College Park. I'm creating a major in social engagement. Uh, I did go to high school in Long Island, New York, so not too far from you, Paul. 
Um, uh, I'm a New Yorker. I like to identify myself as a New Yorker, but I'm also um, the founder and executive director of, of Student Voice, uh, a nonprofit that's working to really engage students in the social community online. We bring them together through our Student Voice Live platform, and we're also developing a pilot program where we actually bring this, take this idea of Student Voice and implement it into the schools uh, in partnership with the schools, of course, but taking the best practices that exist and really having them scale in, within the school system. Um, with that said, you know, looking at MOOCs, um, one of the most disappointing parts about MOOCs is just the fact that retention rates are horrendous. I think that there's like 7% retention rates in some of these um, you know, MOOCs, so students clearly are not as engaged in these conversations as they should be. With that said, uh, you know, how we define MOOCs is also another question because, you know, 96% of students uh, who, have, who have access to internet are using social media, 59% of them are using social media for educational purposes, 50% directly for schoolwork. So the idea that we should be using the internet and, um, and you know, this, the connectivity that comes with the internet for educational purposes is a no-brainer. Um, but, you know, what does a MOOC really look like? Is it as structured? Should it be as structured as a classroom experience is? That's the way traditional MOOCs seem to be right now. Or should it be more unstructured and free-flowing, where there clearly is more engagement and more interactivity there? Um, finding a balance is important, and I think the idea of scalability and measuring success is obviously two, are obviously two of the most important things for uh, the powers that be. Um, but as a student, I like MOOCs, but frankly, it's hard to find time to, or maybe we just don't prioritize it as much as we should, but to, to, do, to use MOOCs when we're taking traditional classes now and MOOCs aren't as uh, well-respected or well-regarded yet as a traditional classroom experience. It'll be cool to say, you know, five to six years, oh, I got an, a degree accredited by Harvard, um, even though I didn't actually go to the school. But right now, people are going to say, oh, well, did you actually go to Harvard? And people will question whether or not that really holds the same value. So that's what's going on in the mind of students. If students even know what MOOCs are to begin with, and most students, or I shouldn't say most, I don't have research to back this up, but many students don't know what MOOCs are just yet, even though many are using it, whether it be Khan Academy or other YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. All right, so as we, let me just ask uh, all of you to keep, to thank you for, you hit a lot of very important points, to keep going um, with this notion of what is MOOC um, and what we want to be thinking about tonight a little bit. Uh, do you want to just jump in, or should we go down the, the line? Why don't we, Verena, go ahead. Introduce yourself and say a little of your experience of what you're thinking right now about MOOCs. And... Hi, I'm Verena, and but I'm... Feel free to jump. Jess, oh. that was a good example. Uh, feel free to interrupt each other, okay, If um, as we go here. Yeah. I'm Verena. I'm from Calgary, Alberta. I'm an online teacher. I, I hero worship Zach. I'm so proud of him and many of the other students doing some incredible work. Um, I know two years, <laughs> yeah, which raises a good point. So I will challenge you already, Zach. So uh, <laughs> K-12 MOOCs. I've been experimenting with K-12 MOOCs or the idea of MOOC defying uh, K-12 and what that would look like. And the first thing is it's not about the massive open online course. It's about an open online community based on any of my experiences. Um, I wouldn't support or advocate massive anything for K-12 to because of the needs that they have, uh, security needs as well as um, just the fact that we've worked so hard to bring down the ratio. Why would we suddenly create a mass industrialized concept um, and, and implement that? Um, I, I mean from a teacher lecture focus, Karen. So I, I'm thinking the traditional MOOC I do not see in a K-12 classroom. It's like an encyclopedia. It's an opportunity to, for enrichment. Where I see the possibilities are we just did a, a gamification type MOOC and we had graduate students working with grade nines and they work together in Minecraft. Um, that's the kind of short, you know, project-based uh, opportunities that I think I'd look for. There you go. So, so, so let me, let me, Dave uh, Cormier doesn't seem like he was uh, doing something in Texas, um, and he wasn't <laughs> sure he'd be able to join us, uh, but he really wants to. 
um, he might be able to. But but I, at least the brief conversation that I had with him on EdTech Talk on Sunday about this similar topic, he, he wants to hold on to the word massive um, in MOOCs um, and, and think about how um, many, many, many interactions. It's, I mean, the, the, what he said is, you know, you have, if you have a thousand people standing in a room, that, that's not what it's about. It's about the interactions all those people have. So I, I just wanted to kind of um, hold on to that notion a little bit as, as we're discussing this. I, but, but certainly I'm, I hear what you're saying as well. Um, the, other, the other notion that, that kind of surprised me, because I'm all about community and ongoing community around Youth Voices, for example, um, and around this show, uh, is, is that it's his notion that in order to get something done in that kind of massive way, it needs to be uh, clearly marked. There are going to be 10 weeks here. Um, we're going to do something. So I just wanted to point out you know, those kinds of definitions are, are floating out there, too, and I think are at least making me think a little bit. Tommy, do you want to introduce yourself? Sorry. Hi, my name is Tommy Buteau, and I'm a teacher in uh, Colorado, and, uh, and this is my daughter, Imani. She's with me tonight, um, and uh, I'm just interested to find out uh, what people are thinking about this, because we've explored the option of doing um, you know maybe grammar type videos and having students look at those before coming to class and 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 I mean that's as much thought as I've put into it really so I'm just interested in finding out uh, what other people are thinking about this and how other people are uh, considering using uh, these type of, uh, of uh, ways of having students connect online so I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing what everybody has to say tonight. Cool. Welcome. Stephanie, West Park. Ah, that was Thank muted. You. Okay. Um, so, hi, I'm Stephanie West Puckett, and I teach writing at East Carolina University, and I'm part of the um, Tar River Writing Project. Um, I started last summer thinking about MOOCs when I was asked to participate um, as a co-facilitator in the Making Learning Connected CL Summer MOOC uh, with National Writing Project, part of the Educator Innovator um, Programming, and had a wild ride of a summer, uh, really just fantastic in terms of being able to connect with other people and network and really try out some new things and just be inundated with ideas every day um, and then we've been remixing that idea of the making current learning connected MOOC locally um, we're right now engaged with a um, middle school here in Greenville um, and we've been uh, remixing the CL MOOC and and uh, connected learning approach to MOOCing over the last 12 weeks uh, with middle school teachers and it's been a, a very different experience than what we had last summer. Um, the folks that came last summer were educators uh, in and outside of the classroom uh, and this is a bit different because it is a school partnership and so we're working with teachers who are in one building but the interaction is happening um, you know, on their end in the building and then through the MOOC. Um, but we have folks who are not very uh, comfortable with technology, who had never done Google Hangouts and Twitter chats and some of the platforms that we're using. Um, and so it's been really interesting to think about what kinds of support teachers who are not already connected in these ways might need in order to engage um, and to become part of these conversations. And so that's something worth thinking a lot about these days in, in my area. Well, oh, thanks for that contribution. Karen, you wanted to say something? Hi, I'm Karen. I'm going to just say something quickly and then jump out and then maybe jump back in later to let some other people in. But I just I wanted to talk about two things in terms of what is a MOOC. And I would say, you know, overall, MOOC does not mean one thing. And, and when I first started getting involved in taking and then facilitating MOOCs, I was kind of unexcited about the whole idea of MOOCs. But I think CL MOOC and some other experiences showed me that MOOCs are not all the same thing and, and the sort of particularly the differentiation between X MOOCs and C MOOCs which are more connectivist I think is really important and I think you know I've, I've always sort of argued against the massive in terms of like making that a goal but I think one real opportunity with massive is having a huge 
a huge group and then allowing people to sort of subgroup based on their interests or passions and I think that's really interesting and you you really do need it seems like some number I don't know what it is over a thousand but depending you know depending on the group you need a really large community to allow those subgroups to really form and then you're in a much smaller group environment so it's kind of a multi-leveled thing yeah, you know, Dave. Dave also said provocatively um, that you can't make a MOOC. You can. Um, yeah, there's. I can't talk. You can't make a MOOC. You can. It, it just happens. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. that's worth thinking about too. But but I but I certainly then we challenged him and thought about how you can nurture one um, along. But yeah. Well, um, and I think the overlap between course and community and where they intersect is interesting because I do think that. Um, the start and end dates of a MOOC, the way the way most are configured, I think they're really important. But I think where you have a MOOC that grows out of a more ongoing community, like Writing Project or, or other groups, then I think people can sort of jump into different courses with start and end dates, but you have a, an overarching community that persists over time. So that might be one way to frame that. Mm, let's get some other voices in here. Michael Barber. Barbu, I'm sorry. Say your name for me. I'm sorry, Michael. Welcome. Oh, yeah, right first first time. I'm Barbara. Hi, Barbara. Okay, good. <laughs> Michael. Uh, hi, I'm Mike Barbara. Yeah. Um, I'm the uh, uh, Sacred Heart University in Fairfield, Connecticut, so just up the road from Paul uh, by about an hour. Um, it's interesting as I, I've been sitting and, and listening in because a number of um, – uh, I've heard a couple of times the term traditional MOOCs. And the, when the people have said the term traditional MOOCs, they have tended to go on and then describe the types of things that edX and Coursera and some of the others are doing, which I thought was interesting because when I think of traditional MOOCs, I don't think of those X MOOCs. I think of those C MOOCs. In fact, the, the X MOOCs, um, David Wiley sort of, I think, cleverly dis, you know, described them and used the term um, instead of massive open online course, he actually used it as massive opportunity, massive obfuscated opportunity for cash. Um, and I think that actually is a very good descriptor of the the ex MOOC idea. You know, this idea of how do we, and you know the conversation around it. I think has been a good one because the main thing that they talk about now is how do we monetize this? How do we credentialize this? And, and you know, I mean, Zach even mentioned that idea. You know, at the beginning of you know how do we you know, get it to the point where we can offer up this idea of credentials so that I could say, you know, I have a Harvard education. Um, you know, there's a reason why, I mean, when you look at sort of how a lot of this started within the online higher ed environment, it was, you know, with the open courseware projects. Within the K-12 environment, it tended to be through the Khan Academy. I mean, what they're looking at here is let's just put content out there and let other people sort of coordinate it and curate it and use it for their own purposes and I, I think that's sort of a lot of what is getting lost it's that that curation aspect that um, you know we're losing with this idea of you know how do we formalize and monetize uh, MOOCs um, you know so I, I think Michael. I'm here sort of as that that contrarian voice which is one I fall into quite nicely can you can you talk a little more of your own experience with with MOOCs? Um, sure. I mean, I've 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 run um, one on uh, K twelve online learning, and um, I've been quite active within the the K twelve community in general, just looking at at this uh, particular issue. And I know Verena and Rye have talked a number of times uh, about this. Um, you know, and how we can sort of put this into a K-12 environment. And um, I, I won't put words in Verena's mouth, but I think she probably agrees with me when I say, you know, that for the most part, at least within the K-12 environment, it seems that it's a, a great tool for professional development for teachers. But in terms of with actual students, it tends to be more of a, a co-curricular or extracurricular kind of thing, um, you know, ones that sort of, you know, your high ability students might take advantage of or those that have a very specific specialized interest in something and in both instances neither of those particular groups are all that interested in the credentialization aspect of it. All right. All right, so we're just sort of laying it out here, I think, still, and, and getting other voices in. Kevin, do you want to? 
Uh, sure. Hey. Hello. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Kevin Hodgson. Um, so I'm Kevin Hodgson. I'm uh, out in Western Massachusetts, part of the uh, Western Mass Writing Project, and um, helping facilitate the CL MOOC as well. And um, you know, I've I guess I come at it from um, being a, a participant in a couple of um, connected MOOCs, um, and then also trying to design and help help design and help facilitate one as well. And um, you know, it's interesting because when I've been in them, um, some have worked a lot better than others, um, and I, I don't always know what the magic thread is that kind of makes that happen, um, like what brings a certain uh, kind of person into the community that then allows you, as Karen was talking about, to suddenly connect with people and, you know, go from that big scale to the smaller connections and, and draw off that energy. Um, and I, I know as we kind of talk about the design of uh, this summer's uh, CL MOOC, you know, we're trying to find ways <clears throat> that there are opportunities uh, for that open connection and, um, and a lot of pathways for people and how to make that all kind of work and, and you know, those possibilities there for people. But it, it's tricky, too, because um, uh, I've been in a couple that um, just haven't done it for me at all. And I'm not always... I try to reflect on why that is, but I can't kind of always put my thumb on it either. Um, but, I mean, I like the idea of uh, maybe the word massive, um, you know, we talked about that earlier. Um, I like that, as you mentioned, Paul, maybe it was from your discussion with Dave, too, about, you know, when you bring people together, it's the connections that you make within those communities that really um, kind of keep draw on that. Um, that's been the fascinating part for me. Cool. Jose, thank you, Kevin. There you go. Unmute one more time. You're still muted. There you All go. right, here we go. This is uh, yep. Jose Hart in Los Angeles. I'm a fifth grade teacher. And for me, the, the, the idea of a MOOC uh, goes back to community. I mean, uh, I began kind of here at, at Tech Talk, you know, back in like, 2005, 2006. And throughout those years, you know, different connections that I've made, uh, and looking at growing as a you know, as a teacher and, and bringing stuff back to my to my students and I I've had the opportunity to participate in several MOOCs and and, and for me can I you know learn from this or what experience can I take back to kind of my day to day you know regardless of what others are doing around me but it's, it tends to be a very like a, a isolated experience uh, locally or face to face. And so, um, if uh, you know, last summer when I participated in the Connected Learning MOOC, it was that opportunity to uh, see what the you know, National Writing Project was doing in other places, and then bringing it back to LA. And and and, and now what I'm seeing in nowadays is like I'm taking these experiences that are online and they're becoming uh, face to face uh, through uh, ed camps and through other things. And so, I mean, that's where I'm at. I mean, right now I just started a MOOC with. Um, uh, Spanish-speaking educators, uh, Diego Leal, uh, is doing a, a, a MOOC uh, that's called uh, Tejiendo Redes, or Making uh, Connections. Uh, it's kind of the same idea, but again, it, it, it's, uh, this, uh, the, there's an ongoing community that's coming back, that's coming back, and that's connecting in different ways, and, and, and that's what I, I, like to, I, I like to do nowadays. Before, I was more of a, I wanted to stay in one place, and, and now I'm kind of all over. And even in even in different languages, and and the summer, I, that, that's what I intend to do. You know, go back to the connected learning MOOC and and see what uh, folks are up to, and and, and, and kind of uh, uh, play and, and learn. And and when I go back to to, to my class in, in August, you know, with, with a few more ideas, and you know, in, in LA, everything's massive. I mean, in our schools, I, we're we're at the end of the, the school year, and, and we're implementing a um, a project that's called um, it's a science uh, social studies uh, kind of a uh, a uh, unit, and you know we have 500 elementary schools are doing the, all doing the same thing. And now I'm thinking of the idea of the MOOC. How how can we get all these kids? And, you know, LA is going one to one. You know, we're getting like you know 500,000, 600,000 iPads. And so how how do we how do we get these kids with the tech, you know, devices in their hands? How can we get them to connect? Because they're not. I mean, they're just doing what they, whatever the teacher tells them, and in a very unengaged way. And so, the, for me, that that that's that, that's what I'm lo looking forward to with uh, with this MOOC and uh, any other experiences that I participate in. Well, Christina, could we have you jump in at this point? I'm sorry. Yeah. Sure, sure. Hi, um, I was just uh, Jose. That's really exciting to hear. Um, just kind of the ways that you're kind of taking sort of what we did last summer and you know making new connections and thinking about connections and. 
Um, and you know, it was wonderful to work to meet you last summer, actually, in the MOOC. Um, and I guess um, one of the things I wanted to mention, people have mentioned different things about the one that we ran at the National Writing Project that we're doing again. Um, but we really thought of it as a massive open online collaboration. So we um, we took that sort of that piece really seriously, and in fact, we tried to really break the framework of a course altogether. And um, Paul, you were one of the inspirations for this too, really reminding us, you know, it's the summer. Teachers, sure, teachers are interested in teaching, but they're also interested in other things. And if we're really going to take a connected learning approach to this, don't we actually have to ask teachers to tap into their interests and follow their passions? And you know, so so we really built it in a collaborative way as co-learners, as co-educators. Um, and I thought that was just an interesting way to think about um, these open online spaces and how we can work in them together. Um, so, um, and one of the things, so just picking up on what Jose said, I mean, I think that <clears throat> what we got to was a, um, and I'll, I'll try not to make this short because we can talk more about it later, but we, what we got to was kind of a framework that both provided some structure, so to the point that like MOOCs just happen, I'm not sure, <laughs> like there's some structure, right, like I think that's an interesting conversation to push on a little bit, and but then these, but there was not so much structure that things couldn't emerge. So there was enough structure for things to emerge that we never would have predicted. So everything Jose said, I mean, it's not like we could have, you know, um, really predicted that. We hear these stories all the time of how people took some of the learning they did the summer and then are making whole new connections and. Um, so it's really the combination, so I'm really interested in the balance between the structures provided and the emergence that happens, and then how we learn from that emergence, and then this year, this summer, we're taking this idea of emergence and really saying, so many people led the MOOC last summer, let's invite more people to lead the MOOC. So we have, you know, like we're trying to expand the leadership out so more and more people can lead this year. Um, and again, sort of what frameworks need to be there so that more people can lead and more emergence can happen. So that's kind of like the running question right now, I would say. Mm -hmm. So Dave Cormier did join us. Um, we were quoting you earlier, Dave. Um, uh oh. So, <laughs> so do you want to just, um, and Nikhil, um is with us as well. And um, Nikhil, do you yep. want to jump in and say hello? And then we'll get the data. Hi, how's it going? Um, yeah. my, my video has been having some issues, but um, thanks so much for having me today. Um, for a quick introduction, I'm uh, I'm an author, I'm an activist, um, I'm also a journalist, and I published a, a book last a few years ago, and I'm working on my new book, which is looking at alternative forms of education, and I'm also involved in uh, a campaign uh, on students' rights, so we're trying to introduce a student bill of rights in, in the United States. Um, but uh, looking forward to continuing our conversation. And so, have you thought about MOOCs at all? Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I it's been a it's been a subject that I've thought quite a bit about. Um, but you know, should I talk now, or I mean, no. is yeah, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. So, um, so yeah, I, I, my my opinion on MOOC is very nuanced. I would say that um, for there's quite a few. Um, it's a very contested debates among academics and, and, and students and, and educators. But what I would say is that um, there are some benefits of MOOCs in terms of the self-directed learning aspect. It's giving access to these free courses for people to use around the world and um, free content, etc. Um, so that's one benefit. But I think there's a, much of it has to be very, in my opinion, very negative. Um, and the reason for that is in most MOOCs where you see in Coursera and Udacity and edX, they're very much so based in the lecture style of learning. It's a traditional pedagogical uh, model still. There's a teacher, they're lecturing to you, you're doing homework problems, and you're getting grades or you're getting a certificate at the end. So it's very much so in the same vein of traditional education. The other part to this is that, um, and some people have 
criticize MOOCs as a form of neocolonialism, where MOOCs are trying to, there are these Ivy League, they're, all, they're very much so at these Ivy League institutions, elite schools, and oftentimes they are being, um, uh, uh, there, there are companies that are trying to model them in, in Africa, for example, using Western curriculum, using Western tools, Western language, and not adapting it to local circumstances. Um, so I think there's both situations. You have the fact that it's very much so lecture lecture based, and I think that's what a lot of people don't don't really realize. It's not really a revolution, in my opinion. It's still very much so in the same vein of 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 educating children as we've been for thousands of years. Um, and but I think at the same time, it is a great tool for self-directed learners. Cool. Okay, Dave. Whatever is on your mind. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, crank him up and let him talk, eh? Um, <laughs> I don't know. How. Yeah. <laughs> what, was, what was the gentleman's name before me? I didn't quite catch it. Nikhil. Oh, Nikhil. 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 I, I, I mean, I agree with you on many counts there. Um, I just came out of two days of meetings with edX and with the University of Texas talking about trying to... In the belly um, of the beast. Go ahead. In the <laughs> belly of the beast. <laughs> trying, actually, I'm still here in Texas. Um, <laughs> trying to talk about how to make those MOOCs a lot less instructivist than they are. Um, the the fact is is that so many of them were done, were originally created for things that were mastery learning type items. So if you're trying to learn the basics of math, it is very difficult. And there are very few people's approaches to pedagogy for math that don't include an instructivist mastery learning approach. There are some. Um, but because a lot of those technologies that you mentioned, Udacity and edX particularly, were created by scientists who were trying to teach people introductory science. Um, there's a big legacy there, and I don't think, I think there's a lot less neocolonialism in it in its overt sense. Like I don't think they were actually going out to try to mastery learning that in the same way that the UK government, for instance, five years ago overtly stated they wanted to do so. Um, but rather, I think that there just hasn't been a lot of really good pedagogy applied to those MOOCs. Uh, particularly the pedagogy that would allow you to teach something other than first-year math. Um, so I think that the work that is trying that actually not think I know there is a lot of work trying that that's being done right now behind the scenes, trying to make that those platforms into something that would allow um, you to have more collaborative approach to learning. Right now, it is not possible inside those platform inside of edX to do so. Certainly, the people at the University of Edinburgh, for instance, have done a great job of it inside of Coursera. If you look at Ed C. MOOC and the stuff that they did, it's a really fantastic model, I think, for learning and for openness there. Um, so I think that, broadly speaking, you are correct. There are certainly exceptions to the case. The MOOCs that are being spoken about here, however, certainly the one that was taught last summer that the, the folks here are talking about, is a totally different beast. Um, and is rather taking the internet for what it can do and allowing people to come together and learn together. And I think it's it's unfortunate that the original vision of MOOCs has been clouded by this sort of crazy retro instructivist pedagogy rather than for the real amazing efforts that have been done by educators all over the world to create environments to allow people to come together and learn together. Do you want um, to say goodbye to Zach? By, by... Bye, Zach. Yes, go ahead. He's going back to um, study. Not on so MOOCs, I just... unfortunately. <laughs> I, I'd like to um, I'll just just tag that for Nikhil and for the work that he's doing. I think that um, you're quite right, and I think that's that's a very important part of the story. But I think there's another part of that story as well. I'm very interested in the planning that you guys are doing for running the MOOC this summer, the second time, um, because running MOOC for the second time brings in all kinds of really interesting questions about. Um, how you deal with your returnees and, and what exact role that they have and whether or not they have like a special role. Are they tutors? Are they community managers? Um, do you totally change the curriculum so that everybody can do it again for the first time together? Or do you recycle a lot of the same stuff so that you can have mentors coming in the second time? And I think those questions end up being really interesting community questions that um, that are about how you how, you, how do you talk about community? So, you know, I, I have my own sort of work that I've been doing recently, and my, my community, or uh, the community that I'm involved in, um, there's a lot of talk right now about how other people come in and who should be allowed to come in. And the, the essential sort of 
You're talking about Rise of 14. Rise of 14. The essential and weirdness is there, of is there a Rise of 15 planned or there is for January? Okay. Yeah, totally. Okay. Go ahead. Um, but the essential weirdness of community, which is you, and we talked about this last week, you can't have a we without a them, and that that idea that identity is by its nature the it's also it's the inclusion of some things, but it's a rejection of others, and and how do you take a bunch of people? Um, who are who had an experience together? Who have an identity formed through that experience? And how do you include other people? And how do you sift that together? And I think those are the kinds of challenges that are pretty much unique to the internet. Um, you certainly see them in in military, like in in sort of large scale war pieces where you have collections of people and new collections coming in. Um, there are other kinds of relocation items that would have happened in communities and in various times of strife, but in the normal everyday regular running of things, the the number of times, like let's say 500 people, you would have 150 of the core people of those to return to something, and another whole huge infusion of other people come in. We just don't have a lot of models to handle and to understand what that means. From an under from a community perspective, so I'd be really interested to hear more about uh, what kinds of plans you guys have in terms of like, do you change everything so that there's a common starting point? Do you ask people to return as mentors? Do you sort of create new roles for people? Like how you guys are going to handle that? I think that's that's really compelling stuff. And I'm going to start stop calling on people. So please jump in now. What have you been thinking? What do you want to go to? I think those are really good questions, Dave, and um, we have been talking about how that will look in the second year, um, and I, I guess I'd say yes. <laughs> so what I mean by that is that, yes, some people are going to be invited back to lead some of our make cycles, uh, and Christine can jump in too, um, if I'm not getting this all right as we're kind of talking about it. Um, and yes, we're going to be having people as part of, um, you know, different kind of, uh, uh, we have teams going on, support teams that are going to be helping folks uh, navigate their way through the summer. Others are working on the design elements of what it will look like. And, you, you know, I guess it's, I guess it's that structure of putting something in place so that the unexpected can happen. And, uh, you know, that's the challenge, I think. Um, but, yeah, we're trying to honor people who are going to come back to us from last year um, and find a way to have them still feel like they're, it's their community that we're building off of as well as starting new and, yeah, that's a it's a tricky balance, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, just to um, everything you said, I'm sure is right, <laughs> Kevin, and um, and uh, Steph should join in here too. I think what we're trying to do is really like take a moment, or what we were trying we did, Dave, was try to take a real moment of discovery since the last one, and really listen to people. What did they learn? What were they passionate about? What you know what what happened out of the MOOC, and then start to ask people. You know what if we were to do this again, what would you want to lead? What 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 mm -hmm. what would really move you in that um, in this work? And then just try to build out kind of increasing leadership teams, leadership opportunities. Where could we let someone else lead and let go of this thing? Mm -hmm. Where could we? You know what? What spaces? What cracks can we increasingly open up to sort of develop the leadership? And um, and it's starting to come together. I mean, Kevin, uh, Kevin was talking. Um, we were talking yesterday, and it's a little. Um, I don't know. It's it's kind of scary to open this thing that felt so successful last year, yeah. but we also feel like it's not going to be successful if we don't open it. I so, totally I understand what you're talking about. Yep. Do it again, right? So. So that, I think, is really exciting. And um, um, I was going to say that I, I wonder how much, and I'm not going to be able to make the theoretical link at all, but how professional communities of practice and that literature have ways for people to sort of take on leadership within their communities and then move into communities of practice together. So I do think, I mean, and it's sort of the theoretical background that's, that we sort of swim in at the writing project. Mm -hmm. So... I haven't fully connected those pieces yet, but it is a place that I'm wondering about. What can we learn from the from that literature, and how we build communities like this? Yeah, that that feels useful if the community is a, 
has clear content, you know, like if it's a science community or a engineering community, but what is the content of CLMOOC? Do mm -hmm. <laughs> Always asks the easy question, there, okay? I know. I love Paul's questions. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it seems less about content though, and more about shared interest. You know, shared shared interests, shared purposes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the the shared issues, shared values, and and building a community to explore those and and to push at those. But I guess I'm I still wonder. You know, we're asking questions about the folks who came last year and, and what are their roles this year. And what about the folks who didn't come? I mean, we're right. in a sort of interesting place because our network um, is, is vast and, and we know not everyone in our network is, is interested in participating. But I also know from my local work there are a lot of folks who are interested and the, the tools and the help and support that we tried to produce last year. And I think it was good stuff, but it still wasn't enough. Um, and I'm wondering what kind of roles, I guess, um, folks on the ground might play in providing the sort of support that people need, uh, you know, in order to, to connect, to sort of get the flow and the feel and the understanding and to sort of take some of the fear out of, of doing this work when it's not part of your comfort zone. And I'm seeing that quite a bit now in the, the work we're doing with the middle school and trying to remix CL MOOC on the local level. Can, yeah. I, can I ask a separate question? Um, uh, sorry, Paul, I know I'm, I'm a divergent sort of yeah. guest here, but uh, if there's a place for that, it would be here, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was uh, very much the similar conversation I was in about three hours ago. And <laughs> for, those of you, for those of you who know George Siemens, um, he and I go back a long way. And I was trying to corner him and the group that's trying to launch this learning analytics MOOCs in, in, in October. And I said, look, can you explain to me what it is that you as a facilitation group want to get out of the course? Because when I think about a MOOC, um, it's, if it doesn't hold coherently and clearly for the people who launch it, if it's not at some point about them and what they want to get done. And I don't mean in the sense that it's all about me and I want it all to be about Dave. I mean that it's the passion of the people who run these things that pull them together. And I think there's always a risk of overthinking these things and forgetting why you got into it in the first place. And, and there's something about, and you know, Paul's a great example. The, the tone of this show has been consistent for... I don't know, 7,000 episodes or however many Paul has done. And the reason why it consistently works is because the reasons why Paul seems to do it, I don't know if Paul can explain why he does it, but there's a, there's a, there's a consistency there that sets the tone for the rest of what happens. And I think that my belief, and this is just me talking out of nothing and just the stuff that I've done and my feelings about this, is that there has to be a consistency from the leadership group, whatever that is, from the core group, from the core community, call it whatever it, it is, and I think it'd be different in different places, but that that is really, really critical, that that group not overthink what they're trying to do, not change what they're trying to do for reasons other than what that core community is trying to get done. I think a commitment to that is, is more important than all the rest of the things combined. So that's just that's my feelings about this right now. Going back to the big question about what is a MOOC, MOOCs have core communities. They always do. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah, think that's obvious. <laughs> yeah, and and some MOOCs are more transparent about their core communities than others. And yeah, you know, yeah. I, I just wanted to say that um, one of the things we're going to try to do this summer is do, um, and hopefully Steph will connect with us around this um, with her local work too is really to do some research to gather like how follow some case studies so so really to figure out how do we talk about the ways that um, people create communities in these spaces how what does participation look like like to unpack that from numbers and really be something else um, but the community question is really interesting to me just because we saw we we have heard so many stories about what people have been doing in communities, really strong communities, 
we never saw it on the MOOC. There was no, like, it didn't show up anywhere. <laughs> and then we hear these stories. You did what with this? And with who? And, I mean, it's been amazing. So yeah. part of it is actually, like, there are communities, you know. I, like, I think that there's multiple, and there's multiple ways that people participate. In. There's multiple mm -hmm. ways that people form communities and interest groups. And, um, and how, we don't even know. <laughs> so, like, trying to get, like, to, to do a little study around some of that so we can talk better about what we think is happening here. I, but I think that the, the flip side of that is that you don't necessarily know how your commitment to what you guys are doing has an impact necessarily, and then the research can sometimes fool you into forgetting why you got into it in the first place. And that that's my only caution, mm -hmm. is that if you dig in too deep... I mean, there's nothing more, I, I don't want to get weird about this, but there's nothing more anti-capitalist and anti, like, the way that our world normally works than running a MOOC, like the one you guys ran and like the stuff that I do. Why are we doing it? Well, what are we getting from it? I don't know. Why do I do it? Why does, why has, and again, I keep using um, Paul as an example, why has he done 647 episodes? <laughs> because it because matters. Episodes. Right? Because... Because there's something about, and you know, I, I'm from the Jeff Liebel school here too, there's something about connecting with people that's important, and it doesn't matter if it's 10 people or 1,000 people. There's something about being on that side of the game, uh, where being part of the let's get together and make it better if we can, that matters to me. And, and it matters to a lot of people that, that I work with. And I think that um, because of that, the research angle, while it's important for funding, and I understand it's necessity for a lot of reasons, it can also, like, I've had people come back still from the early Ed Tech Talk episodes. It happened to me a couple weeks ago, where I talked to somebody and they went, oh my god, the last five years of the work I've done is based on what you guys were talking about in 2005. I'm like, what? I don't even know who you are. I'd, I'd never met the man before. But those, those, the beautiful thing about openness is the unintended consequences. You know, and to me, that's a commitment to the mission. Anyway, I'll stop babbling about that. One to re respect Jose's mention early on that he had to leave early um, and see if he wanted to say something before he did leave. Is that still true? <laughs> I <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of listening in and, and hearing, you know, going the second time around or the third time around or the fourth time around, whatever time. And, and, and you, know, you know, if I can share an experience with... Uh, the Spanish-speaking folk, uh, Diego Leal has been you know, doing a MOOC, uh, kind of modeled on George Siemens, and, and you know, and, uh, the MOOC, the, the first connected MOOC that uh, there was, uh, the massive MOOC that was online, and and we went back and 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 he's now like in the fifth round where he's taking this core group of uh, educators, you know, from all over Latin America, and and, and it's it's pretty big. I mean, it's several hundred, and and they're coming together over, um, you know, like a Two or three times a year, we're starting a new MOOC, and then uh, and I've I kind of um, been a lurker in and out, in and out, but um, just uh, just the idea we can go back to some you know understanding of how we connect with each other, understanding how we can take it back to our local like you know uh, uh, let's say institution, our local schools, and and that's that's what's happening now. You know, he's we have like local facilitators of, uh, or or local universities taking uh, roles where the, where they're leading a face-to-face -face kind of uh, environment with the MOOC, and 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 I, and I check in, you know, <laughs> I, I check in and, and and I kind of share what what I've been doing, you know, in the states because you, you look you look at the map, the participation map, and it, and it's everybody's in Argentina and Colombia and Brazil and, and these places, and then you go up to the U.S. and, and the U.S. or Canada or, or all these places are are, are very active. But there isn't a, a, a con there isn't like a convergence, or there, there is, we're not communicating with each other. We're doing the same things, <laughs> so it's just it's just interesting uh, uh, to me. Where, and where could people see that? What is? Uh, the, I, I, I'll put the I'll put the link here in, in our in our chat in, inside the the hangout. But uh, that it's uh the the blog is called Reaprender, which is to relearn. So to to relearn, and then uh, tejiendo redes is uh, making webs or making connections. And so Diego Leal, you know, Diego Leal, what I consider is a, like a super blogger, kind of to me like the Will Richardson of the 
or the uh, you know David Warlick or those kinds of folks. And so uh, he, he's able to he's able to do that from the university level, but taking it all the way down to I mean uh, I'm an elementary school teacher, but I can still connect with the ideas. And so uh, I mean, well, that's uh, and, exciting. Yeah, and, and now for for me uh, as a, a second uh, going around to the second time to to the connected learning MOOC. You know, last summer I was just kind of like playing and playing, and so that's what I like. I, I, I like this. It wasn't about the tool or what I can do with the tool. It was about just that exploration part, and and that excitement. And, and then and then when I go with my kids and say, "Oh, let's play with this. You know, what can we do with this?" Right? <laughs> and, and then when the principal walks in, everybody takes out that book again. <laughs> so I mean, th th that's what it's about. You know, exploring <laughs> and, and learning and and, and, and connecting. Yeah. I mean, your your vision of 500 elementary s schools mm -hmm. sort of doing the same thing, but not. And what well, would happen if there was a move connecting some well, of that? See, is, is see, interesting. Yeah, we we took a like there was a, there was a grant. It's called the Teaching American History Grant, and they created like a curriculum for the end of the school year tied right. to the Common Core, you know, tied to the Common Core nonfiction, blah blah blah, all this other stuff, right? But the idea was uh, let's build a space colony. And when you build the space kind of let's uh, let, let's uh, let's see where we can build it, and and so there was a scripted curriculum. But see, I I, I can go beyond the scripted curriculum, and I can get the kids uh, <laughs> building uh, the content and going out on the web, and especially if we're going to go one to one with the, with the devices, I, I can see so many opportunities. And then these these are 500 elementary schools uh, all around the the city, right? And so they, there's a lot of uh, conversation that can go on there, and then we can connect with kids all over, you know, because it's space and exploration and adventure. I mean, that that's something that's like a universal concept that, that all of us want to do. And so, and uh, so, in the, in the, the MOOC idea of, of opening it up and, and making it massive, you know, now we can just uh, have the space for for these conversations to happen. I like yeah. what you're getting at, though, Jose, because... This is the, Marina, go ahead. Yeah, yeah sorry. Um, okay. uh, because you're getting to the kids. You're getting to the learners. The best thing about a MOOC for me, or the thing that hit me the most, was that I didn't learn this way. I've never been given this opportunity, um, whatever that means. So Dave's here. Don't even try to get me to define what that would mean. But it's um, the ideas and opportunities that we never had before by learning in networks or learning in the open. So so I'm I don't understand how we're not bringing that more to K to 12 and um, and what are the barriers and what are things that we could maybe talk about a bit more in order to encourage our students like you said to learn in connected and networked spaces and I, I think it requires a continuum don't get me wrong I'm not saying I want my six-year-olds in an open completely open space um, but what does that look like and wh where is that happening and thinking about your thing this summer I, I don't know of many kids who want to take a course this summer and it's for the teachers I think or educators but how how could we mentor students in that capacity I mean um, I tried that the first time I did the MOOC but it, I'm thinking of Dave on that because I went in. I didn't know what I was doing. I followed exactly the design from the Change MOOC and and followed everything that they did. And it was everybody else who stepped up and helped me out because uh, I was by myself. There was no community until it was created within the MOOC. I was literally started it to try to experiment. So how do we bring in the kids? How do we bring in those learners and give them the opportunities? Those are great questions. I, um, you know, it's funny because um, we have talked a little bit about, and Christina maybe could correct me on this, but initially we were talking about ways to, and I think we're still talking about ways to, you know, uh, connect the CL MOOC with uh, students somehow, um, but summer, right, you know, brings difficulties. Um, and also I think it changes dynamics, right, of if, I don't know, I guess I'm just talking off the top of my head here, but uh, you know, just thinking of uh, when you're in a community with teachers, it's different if you're in a community with teachers and students as well. And you know, how does that alter the dynamics of um, what's going on within that? And um, I guess it's one of those things that we're still trying to sift out and and think through. And it goes to the heart of what you know, what the uh, motive or what the goals of the MOOC would be, right? For the online space. I guess last summer we were thinking that the idea was that teachers would experience um, 
you know, the whole make cycles and connected learning, and then bring those experiences back to their classrooms and then have their students be engaged in, in uh, variations of those uh, make cycles and, and really getting your hands, uh, you know, in with play and tinkering and all that kind of stuff. Um, and but to be honest, we're not sure even now, like how much that's spread out. I mean, we, as Christine said, we hear stories which are great to hear, uh, but there's a lot of unknown qualities too. Of you just got to go with faith that you know you're making a difference. The teachers that are then making a difference with um, in the kids' lives. But you know that's going on faith. You mentioned not knowing what it might look like to you know have students involved in there. Um, I mean, one example that. You could look at Rick Fertig with uh, the Michigan Virtual University just ran a MOOC, um, I think it was earlier this year actually, I think it was in January or February, that had both teachers and students involved in it. And I know, at least from the student perspective, they offered them credit through the Michigan Virtual High School for participating in it. Now, I don't know the exact numbers in terms of the students that he had involved, but you know there was some involvement there, and and if I remember correctly, it was probably on about a six to one ratio, if I can. Uh, but I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, you know, so that might be uh, worth looking into. And I know as part of the work that he did leading up to that, they produced, or at least their research center produced a report that looked at the potential of MOOCs within the K-12 environment, uh, both for teachers and for students. So. You know, those might be potential connection points in terms of if that was something you guys were looking at as a model that you could use. Mm -hmm. Jose just left us. Thank you, Jose, by the way. Yeah, um, and um, we've invited him, and I thought he was going to show up. Maybe he's in the chat room. I don't know if there might be room to jump in now um, as well. But um, we'll absolutely continue conversation with um, with Rick, right? Is that right? Is that his name? Michael? Yeah, yeah. Verena, do you want to, you know a little bit about that work, don't you? Do you want to talk about? Uh, Rick's work? Or yes. just the different, op uh, well, he just gave different strategies and different opportunities that you could do. But uh, honestly, and I have talked to Rick about this, to be fair, so I can say this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I suggested, like um, Nikhil and Zach, also point out he followed more of the the um, the CMOOC idea strategy and we are definitely not talking about that tonight so I don't want to the the ideas weren't as connectivist or focused on connected educators and uh, like number one the three examples that he used none of them are actually open still so you can't even see how they were designed or what content was created um, yeah, those are big important <laughs> issues <laughs> for me in any kind of MOOCs and open learning I want to know what you did so that when I find out about it like Dave you said someone said something to you in 2000, you said something in 2005, to be able to go back and find out what that was is important to me so that I can see the patterns and we're talking about researching at Christina as well, That that's what we can start researching, those comparisons. What are you doing? He's dancing. He wants to talk. Let him talk. Oh, but he's, Zach said... I, he's doing something. some sort of Canadian communication, I think. You didn't well, we're we're speaking the same talk. Canadians <laughs> do that. We're yeah. We just Zach had Lewis something really Bieber. neat to say in the post. Hockey, really the hockey. Yeah, Zach said <laughs> it's about students. Like students might not be comfortable with adults. Um, good point. It's where they want to join too. So anyway, thought I'd bring that up. It's in our other chat. <laughs> yeah, Nikhil, can can you come back? Um, and I, I'm. So here's how I want to ask the question. Can you have a MOOC that is about student self-directed, uh, participant self-directed work? Um, yeah, but I, I mean, I just think that, um, I mean, what's, what's your larger point? What do you want to get at? I, I, I don't know. I, <laughs> You, you you mentioned and and I certainly follow and and Monica um, Hardy um, a friend of both of ours here um, has 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 emphasized that maybe MOOCs are about you know um, making visible connections that weren't visible before between people and and helping right. people connect um, but 
if a MOOC is, is about self-direction and finding your own passions and so forth, I mean, certainly it sounds like CL MOOC is, that's what you guys are about with the writing project. We are about with the writing project. But I guess I'm a little worried about it, how far it strays from being a course. Like, and then it becomes hard to answer the question, well, what is this thing about? Does that matter or is right. it okay? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't know if I if you want to frame it in the sense of a MOOC because if I mean if somebody wanted to take a um, I mean I, I know Dave's work and, and a number of other these very unique MOOCs not the in, in the way you see them of like Udacity and Coursera mm -hmm. and such but if, if you um, if you really want to have a MOOC for self-directed learning you would have uh, a comfortable space for people of all backgrounds to share work uh, have have mentorship opportunities to um, exchange knowledge and, and, and skills in different ways. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if I would call it a MOOC. That's the thing, because um, when, I, when I think of a traditional MOOC, I, I really think of the, a course. Like, I don't think of it as a, very much so as a very um, informal learning experience. Any thoughts? <laughs> I guess that goes back to, um, you know, the wrestling over the word MOOC, right? And, um, right. and where, where it's coming from. And because when I think of MOOC, but maybe it's just my own experience, um, I don't think of the Coursera's at all. I think of the, you know, the very open, um, it's actually not in any single space, um, that the learning and the sharing and the connecting happens across platforms, across media. Um, and sometimes you intersect with other people, and sometimes you don't, and the learning goes off on where you want it to go. Um, so. But I don't know how that works for students. You know, if I'm a teacher, and I am, <laughs> I'll just play with my own video here. Um, you know, I, I don't know how that works for my sixth graders. Uh, I, I have a What's hard time What's your concern about that? What, what do you mean? Yeah. Um, I guess it's a combination of, um, of um, thinking about, um, you know, the curriculum that I have to teach. Although, you know, we're I'm not in a, I'm not in a situation where it's a very you know, as Jose was saying, where I'd have to, you know, when the prince walk by, I have to pull out all the books, kind of thing. Um, but, but still, there are things I have to do, and 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 also, to be honest with you, I mean, we don't have the technology where kids, you know, we battle over who gets the rolling cart in our classroom, you know, in our school. Mm -hmm. So um, that becomes a problem too. But maybe it's just my mindset too, uh, you know, trying to move from me the learner into me the teacher with my learners sometimes and. Navigating that um, is, you know, are things I still wrestle with. Mm -hmm. Well, I so thank you. Uh, we, we do need to start ending with a question. Is what I'd like to do. And and here's here's my here's where some of this talk and, and thinking has led me where I'm at this point is I'm very interested in the make banks and what is a make and how is it different than an assignment and you know how do when when you already have a make bank go, going back to the question of you know when there are iterations of these MOOCs, um, how do you use that bank without it becoming a curriculum that people are working through, especially when you're working with kids? Um, because uh, on Youth Voices we have you know a, 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 actually a very similar thing called missions, right? And those can be used in open ways, or they could be used in really sort of not so open ways. So, I'm I'm kind of interested in <laughs> what Jeff Lebo was talking about a couple of weeks ago. Like, what gets curated from from the experience of, of a MOOC, and what do you do with that? Um, but and, and but let me just add one other piece, which is that I what happens on Youth Voices and um, um, is that s teachers and students miss each other a lot. Um, they they'll they'll publish a, you know stuff about the uh, and this wonderful way to write a poem or something, um, and other kids want to do that, but they're off on their own curriculum. So I'm a, almost imagining a MOOC as a way for people to communicate better and um, like make better connections between classes. Um, so just to say, <laughs> Verena, do you want to? say what your last thoughts are here tonight. Um, I think that is a great example of a MOOC. I'm still dreaming of just having our high school classes 
connect and we all teach together um, mm -hmm. in Alberta, I think that would be the first step, even if you got a class from each city. And listening to LA before, where it's all open already or all massive, as you said, <laughs> that's a great opportunity. That's I think that would be the first step, just trying to do something together, and then the students are modeling and you're learning at the same time. That would be my idea. And and from the Dave point of view, resumatic, it whatever happens happens. You have the curriculum, and then you go with it. Anyway, that's my closing thought. Uh, Stephanie. Yeah, I think it's been fascinating for me to see the ways that my experience with last year's MOOC has bled into my face-to-face -face instruction um, and really thinking mm -hmm. about interfaces and structures and, um, you know, in the fall it felt like it was, it was really, um, so the make cycles were ramped up. It was really easy to be in this more connectivist space. But then the further I kind of got from the MOOC and the more I settled into the comfort zone of the local scene, um, the more things started feeling more traditional and like an assignment and less like a make. So it's been real interesting for me to, 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 to see the further I've gotten away from the community um, practicing the, the making and sharing and connecting um, the the difference that it's made in my own teaching and sort of charting that out and thinking through that and thinking about how difficult it is to resist you know sort of traditional instructivist pedagogies and and what possibilities exist for bringing um, you know more of the the connectivist approach in and more of the making and, and creativity into a sort of a traditional research writing based class yeah. thank you Nikhil do you have any final thoughts to me? Oh, sorry. Um, my my mic. Okay. Um, I, yeah, no. I think it's. Um, I'd, I'd love to learn a little bit more about some of the work you guys are doing in, um, in, in your classrooms and your schools, um, that are alternative to the kind of traditional notion of what we call a MOOC. Because I think, um, I think that's great. I think there's a lot of potential in that. I think. I mean, imagine like like I forgot who was saying this, but imagine if you actually had a whole school. Or whole community together on, say, they wanted to learn, I don't know, uh, uh, psychology, or they wanted to learn um, environmental science. They'll all have this platform for people to exchange knowledge, no matter whether you're in the school, whether you're homeschooled or unschooled, or in the in private school. I think that that's uh, a great opportunity for uh, for young people to engage with adults and and find mentors and, and professionals. Cool. Thanks for your contributions tonight. Michael, um, I, I guess there's sort of two things that that strike me as I've been listening in for most of the time. <coughs> Sorry, uh, the first of which is a lot of what I hear people wanting to use MOOCs for this idea of you know connecting different schools and classrooms and bringing all these people together. It actually reminds me very much of uh, the term networked schools, which I see my Kiwi colleagues using a great deal. Um, you know, and they tend to use it in the idea of how do we structurally change schools as opposed to how do we overlay some of these experience on existing schools. Um, the other thing that, that keeps striking me as I'm listening in is this notion of, um, I, basically I hear instructivism being dissed a lot and, you know, I, I'm a researcher guy. Um, and, you know, I look at what the data tells me and, you know, I look at the, the work of John Hattie in particular where he's gone through and, and has done all of these, these metasynthesis on all of these meta-analysis and, you know, a lot of the pedagogies that particularly, and it's not just, you know, sort of the dominant educational reform narrative that comes about, but even those that are countering uh, that, that a lot of these pedagogies that people diss when you look at the impact that they can have upon learning in comparison to a lot of the things that are getting pushed, it, you know, the data just doesn't add up. You know, direct instruction does very well on Hattie's scale. Um, and, you know, there's a reason why we continue to use it. So it, it's, you know, uh, a lot of this is, is chasing the latest shiny object as opposed to chasing things that we know actually can have a meaningful impact upon learning. Great. Thanks. Do I get to go next? Uh, you, yes. 
and then we'll come back to Kevin. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I mean, John Hattie's research is really interesting, and there's lots of research out there. Um, constructivism is 120 years old. It's not something we made up yesterday. Um, so I don't think it's a new and shiny. Uh, many of us are inheritors of 120 years of educational research that has a whole other track of people who have evidence for how it works. And when Hattie looks at an outcome, his idea of an outcome is very different from my idea of an outcome. Connectivism is not. No, it's not 120 years old, but it's based in constructivism. It's another flavor of it. Um, and that's, it's another way of talking about something we've been talking about for a long time. Um, and everybody, I, I just spent two days with the guy who coined the term. Um, he would say exactly the same thing. Um, so when we look at these things, there are lots of people right now in the education space who are talking without any basis in research, no doubt about it. There are ways in which instructivism does definitely produce specific kinds of results. So if you want those five people to remember those five things, getting them to say it over and over again, certainly a better way of doing it than having them sort of come through a problem solving whatever. Um, but each of these different approaches work better in different kinds of circumstances. They're contextual to the people we're with, to the things we're trying to get done. And I think that the the kinds of connectivist, if you want to call them that, MOOCs, um, that we're talking about here are for professionals who are already engaged, who already have years of experience, who are looking for new ways to come together. I would not use that same approach with a 17-year-old who I was trying to do transitions physics with, which is another thing I use MOOCs for, and I would use an instructivist approach to that because the requirements are different. Um, it's just these are nuanced conversations um, and I think that um, the ex MOOC approach and the instructivist critique that's been made to them is that and to speak specifically when you look at the work that Piotr Mitros did when he built edX for the first time it's based in Michelin cheese research from Arizona, Arizona State University and it's based in a version of constructive learning that is only mastery based and some things don't respond to mastery learning and that's where specifically in the research, it's nuanced. And I think anytime we pull out one piece of research and say, there's this, it's not about it being shiny. It's that we all have different things we're trying to get done. And I think that the work that certainly the CLMOOC stuff that, that was in the summer and the work that a lot of people are trying to do with community learning has a lot of real value uh, that doesn't necessarily respond to Hattie's scale. Cool. Kevin and Christina to finish this up here. Kevin, go ahead. Um, I don't have anything to say. <laughs> I'll pass it on. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks for uh, your contributions. Christina, do you want to say anything? Sure. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's at the construct... Um, and, you know, I think it's important that the constructive... constructionist aspect of the MOOC that we've been working on is um, celebrated as, yes, a long-term theory of um, learning by making and learning by doing. And, um, and I really think that what I've learned from working at the writing project long-term is that the act of writing itself is a creative and constructive and production-centered act that supports us as a community of practice in developing and sharing our practices. And I think in that way, the focus that we've had on making, so I thought it was interesting, Paul, that you ended talking about the Make Bank and also mm -hmm. talking about youth voices. Because I think in some ways that that creative focus of these forums really does allow for um, some interesting things to emerge and happen that may not have been predictable from the get-go. And I agree that that we're doing that with a particular intention um, and a particular purpose and a particular context um, where those things are really needed and that's what actually we're trying to do. So um, so I just, I, I always think it's interesting the sort of the affordances of the making and the writing and, and that kind of production centered work. And I think it's pretty exciting to think about across MOOCs and forums like Youth Voices, et cetera. 
thank you all and uh, those who have dropped out. Um, if this feels like we're stopping in the middle, we are. Um, and um, please come back next Wednesday if you're able to, um, and we'll we'll certainly invite you to. Um, and we'll continue this if that's um, okay with you all. Um, and I really do want to get to something practical. I started this by saying this is both theoretical and very practical. Um, so yeah, um, let's let's try to do that. Uh, my what I say here at the end is thank you to Dave Cormier and Jeff Lebo who uh, um, started us off on this this road um, several years ago um, at uh, edtechtalk.com, which is a Channel of the World Bridges Network. Um, thank you all for this conversation tonight, and we hope to see you around and continue in lots of different ways. Good night. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye, everybody. <laughs>